Greetings. This is General CJG here, coming to you with, well, at last, our thoughts and opinions in regards to the recently released Star Wars Visions TV show on Disney+. Plus. Yep, Star Wars anime, finally, at last. So, we gotta talk about it. And joining me here is none other than... Dango Fett, ready to talk about this awesome new Star Wars anime series. Mm hmm Yep. So, with that, now let's get into talking about it. So, first, I think we should talk about what we expected before seeing this show. Which, in a way, you could kind of see that if you watched our trailer reaction of the Star Wars Visions trailer when it came out. So, in a way, we kind of say that here. But we'll go a bit shorter than what we expected uh, on this show right now. So, the jungle, what did you expect on this show? So, I expected something really unique and different than compared to previous Star Wars projects. And something akin to, I keep saying this over and over again, but Animatrix. So it's like the Matrix version with uh, anime incorporated with it, or also the Halo Legend series, which incorporated anime with Halo. And that's kind of what I expected for uh, the Star Wars versions with brand new open ending stories that were just kind of set with each being com completely different from the next and set in their own little mini timelines. Mm -hmm. Yep. I myself just expected Star Wars, but with an anime art style of sorts and a bit of Japanese culture flavor in there. Like, that's what I expected uh, from what I saw. Though, seeing the trailer, there were many different art styles, so I knew it was going to be multiple studios. So I was wondering how they were going to tackle it. So I didn't know much what to expect other than it's Star Wars, but with a Japanese flavor into it. That's what I expected. Not much. So, yeah, there's that. Oh, and we definitely expected it to be non-canon, which, thankfully, it is confirmed, it's non-canon. So, credit on that, because if it was canon, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, would have been a whole can of worms, but thank God it's non-canon. So, yep, that's what I expected. So, indeed, so now I think we should now discuss our thoughts on the show. Now, first we'll go with the non-spoilers, Thoughts. Then we'll go through each episode. So that's how we'll do it. So let's go for our non spoiler thoughts. So let's begin. The Django, you go first. Yeah. So I thought this was a pretty solid entry into Star Wars Visions. And uh, I, I very much liked it. I'm still kind of mixed with a lot of these episodes, but I did have a good time. I did like a lot of the animation styles. Um, every single episode seems completely different from the next and they are very visually entertaining to see so i did like that um i do have some problems with it so we will discuss that maybe a little bit later but overall i did have a uh, good time watching this series pretty short too mm -hmm. my thoughts are that i also thought it was good most of the time two out of three uh of the anime was good for me only one third was not that good in my eyes but we'll definitely discuss that more in detail but yeah i thought most of it was pretty good so yeah um it, like with most of the art styles being pretty good to look at uh the stories were were unique uh some of some of the interesting ideas they had some that they had were also pretty cool uh, like it, like overall, most of the most Star Wars missions was pretty good. So, indeed. Anything else you want to discuss before going to spoilers, to Django? Oh, also, um, I also posted many of my thoughts on my own uh, channel. So we'll probably put in the link in the description of my, you know, my video as well. It's not spoiler, so I I go in more in depth with that. Okay, indeed. So, with that, well. We're going. We're gonna go into Star Wars Visions. So, spoiler warning for those that have not seen Star Wars Visions yet. We're gonna go full detail with each episode, all nine of them. Okay. So, spoiler warning. Okay. So, with that, let's get into episode one, it's the duel. So, the Django thoughts on the duel. God, uh, this was easily my favorite episode out of all of them. 
this is very much akin to Akira Kurosawa's style, and I think it very much borrowed from it. So if you're not familiar with Akira Kurosawa, Seven Samurai, it's black and white and uh, set with st samurai who defend against this village. And it is easily one of the greatest movies of all time. One of the greatest movies of all time, if not the greatest. And I think this kind of like borrows a lot of it because it's also black and white. I think it's, you know, storytelling is a lot different from Seven Samurai. But I think it's very much inspired and it's black and white and it's just visually just amazing to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I really, really like this. This, the first episode made a really, really good impression in Star Wars Visions. Like, it was really cool, like, seeing the Ronin pretty much, like, going in action and pretty much helping the villagers against the Empire. Like, it was great. The art style was superb and, like, Overall, it was like great, and also seeing the ba the battle between Ronin and the uh, female Sith uh, bandit leader, yeah, it was really good. Like all of it was just great. Yeah, I and like as you can tell from the first episode, if you guys don't know, because they're Japanese creators, they borrowed, they pretty much did a Japanese infusion into a lot of these episodes. So for this one, it's like a Ronin, ja uh, you know, Japanese warrior. And you also have a lot of Japanese style with, you know, the village, the villagers, and, um, you know, even like the Imperial bandits, you know, they look like, you know, just rough up versions of regular Imperials that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. Supposedly the, uh, supposedly the bandit leader, the, the one that looked like a, like a dark Jedi, she actually claimed to be a dark Lord, the Sith, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, that's something. And Ronin actually is a former Sith Lord. That's yeah. even more interesting. I that, think that actually surprised me a lot more because I thought he would be a Jedi and I guess he left the path or something. But he ended up being a Sith who left uh, them and became this Ronin warrior. Yeah, like, that, that was very interesting. So, like, episode was really good. The only thing I don't like is when uh, the female Sith... Lord in quotations, Lord, or uh, the the Sith bandit leader. Uh, she had this lightsaber that kind of had a part that resembled a helicopter. Looked a bit <laughs> funny, but eh, my, minor nitpick. Not not much of an issue. It, it's the show. The episode was still really freaking good, like really good. So yeah, I don't. Really I, I, I think it was it was like borrowed from like the. Um, so if you guys are familiar with the Japanese version of like the umbrella, like straw umbrella, you, you've probably seen it a couple times. But they kind of re she removed that and became like this really crazy lightsaber design. I mean, because we've seen a lot of crazy lightsaber designs in Star Wars, but this one was probably the craziest one I've seen yet. Well, we have seen crazy lightsaber designs, but nothing going extremely over the top like this, as was the other episodes yeah. in this anime. But given that it's non canon and it's anime, I they can get they can get away with it, so I, I don't have any problems with that. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also ones. like the, uh, you know, the different, like, people defending the village. Like, you have the Trandoshan with this, oh, I think yeah. he had the minigun, or I think it was the other, the droid they had the minigun. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were trying to defend the village and fight off against the Imperials and stuff like that. Yeah, indeed, definitely. So they were fighting off the Imperials, and Ronin was just like, seems like it's relaxing, and then pr Trouble gets in there and he decides to help, like... Pretty interesting stuff. One thing I find interesting is why did the Ronin have like a several kyber, red kyber crystals? That's what I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I guess he's collecting them or something. And then he gives one to the village chief to keep it that it wards off evil. Mm. It, it's definitely something that probably would be explained in the novel, which I know you're going to be reading, Django. Yeah, I'm interested in it. So they're going to have a novel called Ronin, a Visions novel by Emma Mako Candon. So I am curious to see what they will implement in that because I love this episode the most. So I, I am curious. So I might read this. Mm -hmm. Yep, indeed. So anything else to mention in this episode? Well, I'll say it again. It's my favorite episode and absolutely worth, worth, worth it. The first one you should watch and it doesn't hold back. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think so too. 
Okay, now we go to episode two, Tatooine Rhapsody. Okay, so you want to go first on this one, the Django? Or should I go? You go first. <laughs> okay, so Tatooine Rhapsody. So, starts a bit interesting. Uh, Padawan escaping uh, the Empire. I assume it was Order 66. And then he encounters a hut. And then some rock music begins and turns out that the boy is now part of a band with the hut being a bass player. And and the boy is the vocalist with the guitar. And <laughs> so this episode is basically kind of a... How do I put it? A Star Wars version of a musical? Or a, an episode based on mu- on a musical of sorts? So there is there is some action here with... Uh, favorite of yours, the Django, Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah, Boba Fett is in this one, and they pretty much Boba Fett and and some of Jabba's henchmen. They wanted to take uh, the Hut uh, alive because they because apparently he was well. Let's just say Jabba put a bounty on his head. Typical. So they managed to take the Hut to Jabba, and well, the boy apprentice, well. He manages to convince Java to let the band play, and they play the song, and apparently the entire audience and Java liked the song, that they pretty much, well, that they played more songs and even became Java's personal, uh, I guess, band, because Java was like, became one of their sponsors. So, and that's how we ended. So, yeah, it was mostly a musical, not much. There weren't really much stakes here. I mean, there were stakes, but not that much. So, yeah, that uh, that's what I'll say. So, <laughs> uh, the jungle. What do you think? <laughs> All right. So, I have a lot of thoughts about this episode. So, first, I have to say, I fucking hated this episode. I thought this was the worst <laughs> of uh, the series by far. Okay. Uh... <laughs> so, animation wise, it's decent at best. I think because. Uh, other than the characters, I think everything else looked good. The characters, however, everyone fucking looks like they're like 12 years old, 15 years old. They all look like they're fucking kids, mm. including Boba Fett, who oh, is God. thankfully yeah. voiced by Tamora Morrison, which is awesome. Okay. I must say. Yeah, that that's my biggest problem with the art style, that Boba Fett, one of the most badasses. Okay, there was one thing I did expect uh, before watching this anime, and it was seeing Boba Fett in some sort of badass anime art style like maybe not something like the duel but something like say what we see in episode 7 in Star Wars Visions which we get to later or the Star Wars TIE Fighter anime that is out there in YouTube like something like that like that's what we expected from Boa Fett instead the only episode that we see Boa Fett is in this episode and he looks like a 12 year old version of the adult Boa Fett and it's voiced by 20-something-year-old Boba Fett, Tamora Morrison. Uh, uh, yeah, see, that, that's the thing that gets me, too. Is like, if he wasn't in there, I think it would be better. Because, like, Tamora Morrison, like, I when he voices as Boba Fett, it's this rough and commanding character as Boba Fett. And I expect him to be just, like, this macho character. But in this, like, if he was taken out... I mean, I still would be fine with it it's, because, like, it doesn't fit. Because, like, when I heard Tamora Morrison as Boba Fett, I expected him to be, like, a, like a front row awesome character like Boba Fett uh, in this awesome anime. But throughout this whole series, uh, it, this was the only episode. This this only right here. No episode about him. Just this. <laughs> uh, yeah. There is something I gotta mention. I actually saw this episode and doing others in Japanese with English subtitles. I actually watched uh, Star Wars Visions both in English and Japanese. And I can say that if you change to Japanese, there won't be any difference. Boba Fett is sti- still sounds like he's supposed to be an adult, only Japanese, so it still doesn't fit with the art style of how they draw Boba Fett. So the same problems apply. <laughs> yeah. Changing language is not going to fix this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. And then also, like, with the music itself, the so-called rock music or whatever it was, because it, it was horrific. It was terrible to me. It, it was like a poppy version of rock music. And it just, 
I didn't feel like, oh my god, this is awesome, this is great, this fits the Star Wars universe. Like, I just felt like this was just random rock music that was inserted into Star Wars with Star Wars characters. That was it. Like, I'd probably have a better time going to Disney World and seeing some Star Wars characters play music than this shit, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> uh yeah okay star wars and rock i don't think rock is a genre that makes that mixes well with star wars yes maybe there are some remixes of star wars songs on youtube but they're remixes and they're fan made you don't really expect them something official and if you're gonna make it official at the very least actually do a better job of making it fit into the star wars universe because in here, yeah, it just felt weird hearing rock music and actually being performed live. Like, it'd be one thing if you heard it in a radio in, I don't know, in one of the cantinas of course, or something. Like, that'd be more fine. But actually seeing it, like, blatant in your face, like, yeah, that's... Uh, yeah, it felt more like a Star Wars parody, if you ask me. <laughs> I, I also hate the insertion of, like... <sighs> this is going to be a criticism throughout most of these episodes, is, like, for me, is, like... I always feel like there's just Jedi Sith inserted in every single episode. There always has to be a Jedi. There always has to be Sith in every single episode. Well, mostly just once Jedi or one Sith. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like this, they have to insert Jedi in this. Like my thing is like, why can't you come up with something creative? Like, oh, have something like Coder where you focus on, you know, there's like this one quest where it focuses on a Bith. Mm -hmm. There are some interesting stories with Bith characters who are, you know, the famous musicians you've seen in um, the Star Wars original trilogy. Put that as the front row character and not be this random Jedi who just comes in and has to be becomes this leader of the band and is awesome and everything. Just put a Bith in and you could do like some crazy just band stuff focused on that. Like, I think that would be much more interesting and compelling than this it doesn't even have to be a biff like just make the main yeah. character not be a jedi because okay yeah i yeah. gotta ask was there any point in the vocalist being a jedi because the few times he popped out the lightsaber like it didn't even work <laughs> like yeah it was it, it was course. completely pointless he didn't have to be a jedi he could just be just a random dude like yeah uh, like, i don't know i just I, I didn't like this episode at all yeah, me neither. It, it's definitely... This is one of the three episodes of this show that I do consider to be the weakest in the entire Star Wars Vision show. Like, one of the weakest. And it is a bit of a shame that it comes right after we get one of the best episodes in the entire show, The Duel. Like, right after it. Like, that sucks. <laughs> uh, that sucks. So, let's hope to God we don't get another one of this in Season 2. Oh, God. That's going to be something. <laughs> anyway, anything else to say on this one? <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, no. I think it was only like, what? Uh, it was. I think it was the shortest out of all of them. So that's probably the best thing out of everything about this episode. Shortest by, a, by it was 12 minutes and 45 seconds. So yeah, <laughs> I guess there's that. Okay, so now we go to episode three, the twins. So... Right off the bat, I'm going to say definitely much more interesting and better than episode two. And uh, Art style definitely is better. And the plot is definitely more interesting and more creative. So points on that. Definitely give it credit on that. What do you think, Django? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Twins definitely a better episode. I do think there are some moments where I think they're a bit too over the top. Though then again, this is anime, so I shouldn't be too surprised. But uh, yeah, like for example, when they're literally when the two twins are literally fighting outside in space with no armor protecting them from space, <laughs> and then all the lights and stuff, like a bit too over the top for my taste. But overall, it definitely was still interesting to see. So. <laughs> So. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely more interesting. There's more, it's more action packed, but I feel like there's there's a, so many plot holes and weird moments through, split, like spewed throughout. I mean, like you first start off with like two star star destroyers connected together, and for some reason you had these two twins who were created by the Sith, born with the dark side or something, and then with their power. They could destroy a planet with a star destroyer, with two star destroyers. Not even the size of a Death Star, just two star destroyers. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> 
uh well they need the help of kyber crystal that too um so there's that yeah it definitely sounds over the top it sounds like the anime studio just wanted to make some crazy shit which you know what it's not canon and it's anime so yeah fine go for it uh this was the craziest episode by far i must say agreed (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was the craziest so yeah so the main plot is well it is pretty straightforward the two twins are ready to fire at a specific planet but one of the twins actually decides to not do it he decides to pretty much well not go forth with the plan of using the kyber crystal to destroy the planet because if he does so well the crystal is going to destroy him and his sister but the swiss the sister is pretty compelled in actually going forward with it but the brother doesn't want to, so the brother steals the crystal, tries to escape, but he's surrounded, and then he just he has to fight his sister in order to to not have the kyber crystal, well, be assimilated by the sister's armor, and well, he does manage to save her in the end, and well, after that, well, they just split in their own ways, <laughs> so yeah that's okay a so let, let's go more in depth with this episode because it, it it gets it gets crazier and crazier as it goes on okay so they first start off in the in the deck mm-hmm. so like not in space yet and then all of a sudden they the one of the twins the the guy just shoots out and okay so the girl actually comes out into space and tries to tell like hold the ship with the force powers and um the ship comes back and she eventually fights with her brother and they're both actually their their helmets get torn out and they're both like their armors are gone and they're i guess so they're breathing in space whatever whatever just don't even talk about it <laughs> last jedi logic whatever don't, just don't <laughs> no this makes the last jedi look like child's play <laughs> No, no, it does. I mean, like, it, it, in comparison to that, yeah. But um, as it goes on, she eventually uses the Kyber Crystal to activate, like, she has, like, freaking, like, how many? I couldn't six count how many lightsabers, lightsabers she had because it, it was, like, six. got ridiculous. It was, like, six. Was it six or eight? I lost count at that point. Six or eight? <laughs> I don't know. It was just so much, like, lightsaber action going on. I was just like, wait, wait, how many? I, I just, I, there's just so oh, many lightsabers. Six. It's six. In there. I just read it's six. <laughs> okay. But she uh, uses them as whips, and her brother just, like, holds it with a lightsaber and just reflects it back at her. But she's mainly do- he's mainly not wanting to go through this because he wants to save her in the end. He doesn't want her to get killed. Um, so that's why he's just, just trying to leave and just not get her killed in the process because he saw this in his vision that she would get killed. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as it gets crazier and crazier, they're fighting. The ship that he was on comes back and he uses the Kyber Crystal on his lightsaber to do one desperate move to go... And use the lightsaber to, I guess, extend it or something. And extends it to hit her and the ship. And tells the droid to go into uh, hyperspace. Uh, And freaking destroys the entire ship and destroy like, releases the kyber crystal from her in order to save her. And destroys the whole ship in the process. And he just leaves and that's it. But um, the fact that... This is also a part of Last Jedi where they use the <laughs> no, I light think, speed no, I think this is worse. to destroy the other ship. But this one, they use a lightsaber, and while he's on the ship, juices the hi- goes into hyperspace while he's on it, and just freaking destroys the ship in the process. I, I guess that that's how it works now. <laughs> Uh, okay to put it simply he somehow increased the, the length of the lightsaber times 10 then he then the x-wing literally like <laughs> spin around uh, like upside down and using hyperspace they they he literally cut half of the star destroyer but somehow managed to reduce the length of the lightsaber to only cut the chest of of the sister's armor to only hit the kyber crystal and then he ex- and then he extends the length again to only cut the star destroyer <laughs> oh, my God. oh crap. see see what i see what i mean when i said that this makes the last year i look like child's play 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my god yeah if you ask me this is a star wars anime episode showcasing their all their crazy ideas in anime form with no restrictions whatsoever <laughs> this is i it, it let's to put it simply this is star wars anime porn <laughs> but action porn mm -hmm. not you know <laughs> not not hentai you know yeah yeah <laughs> don't, I, no <laughs> don't look that <down>. yeah <laughs> no like uh, like a shit tons of act over the top action. That's what I mean. It's a it's a barrage of act <laughs> nonstop crazy action. That's what it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> indeed. So yeah, this one was crazy, but it was fun <laughs> seeing the craziness. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I I I'd say this one is in the good one in the good side, but <laughs> but <they're> very crazy. <laughs> so yeah. So overall, what do you think of this one, the jungle? <laughs> utter insanity but it was still entertaining to say the least yeah agreed okay so now we go to episode four the village bride this one definitely is a more interesting one uh and less over the top than the two previous ones so the django shall you go for this one yeah let's see so this episode focuses on a masked lady who uh, we later find out who is a, is a Jedi. Her and this other guy are pretty much just watching over these other two, husband and wife, um, uh, as they're getting married. And you find out they eventually, uh, I mean, after they get married, they eventually meet up with uh, this bandit leader who they have to give up the bride in the process in order to save the village uh, that is there because they are just dealing with these uh, bandits of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually she comes and reveals herself because she's kind of like conflicted with everything that happened in her past because she was fighting with the, you know, the Confederacy at the time and uh, dealing with the Clone Wars and stuff. And she eventually just emerges and helps to save the, the village there. Now, this episode is very interesting because it's very... It's not like your typical action, you know, Star Wars action episode which filled to the brim with action. This is a very quiet, subdued episode and focuses on the brides and just the... I, I like the subtlety of this episode quite a bit. And it wasn't like loud and obnoxious. It was not in your face. It was just very subdued. And I thought it was a really neat episode. I thought it was a different type of thing than we would expect from something star wars related i, I liked it quite a bit mm -hmm. yeah indeed it's well as episode three was over the top crazy action this is the complete opposite so agree yeah which yeah considering what we saw previously yeah it makes sense that this will be a lot more subdued and yeah definitely a lot more calm there's still a, a bit of action at the end but not that much so yeah. this is definitely more uh, trying to actually tell a story instead of trying to impress you with either its visuals or its action. So, yeah, and I think definitely was one of the more interesting ones. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what else do you got to say on this one, the Django? I myself think the art style was definitely pretty good. I agree. Yeah, I did like the art style. Um, they really showed a lot of the backgrounds of like the nature and stuff. And um, I do like the characters as well. I, I think they all work seamlessly in this animation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So our style was really good. Characters were pretty good as well. Like, I don't think there's any negatives I can think of with this uh, episode. It was pretty good. Yeah, agreed. So, mm -hmm. Yep. Anything else to mention on this one? Uh, no. Okay, well, now we go to episode 5, The Ninth Jedi. So this one, well, it starts with basically several Jedi receiving a transmission from a certain uh, a certain Margrave Juro, uh, ruler of the Outer Rim, that he pretty much has trying to, be recru to recruit several Jedi in order to, well, to pretty much give them lightsabers and to rebuild the Jedi Order. However, it seems that Dark Forces were conspiring to pretty much try to take him down. Or maybe he was the, the Dark Sith or the Dark Jedi behind it. Like it, it, it this is not an episode this is not an episode that it 
pretty much give makes it clear who's the villain and who's the who's the hero until the until halfway into it like it definitely has its twists and turns so yeah the jungle do you want to say your thoughts on this yeah i mean i i totally love this episode i think it's right after the duel i love this episode quite a bit and you know you find out that um like the daughter of the lightsaber uh forger she's kind of like she has some pretty powerful abilities as well and you like it was kind of weird to me to see like you put the crystal in and then you basically the color reflects you and it also can extend and retract which was very weird for me to see because i that's not normal at all for me to see at all in the so, Star Wars universe. Okay, basically, uh, so let me explain. So basically, Star Wars Visions in general, not just this episode, it's basically taking the Disney Star Wars' approach of how lightsaber crystals work. They're basically taking the Kyber crystals. The only thing is that this episode and episode 3, they actually took it a step further and actually are doing stuff that not even regular Disney Star Wars does. For example, extending the length of the lightsaber silver crystal that doesn't happen in actual Disney Star Wars but the color representing your mindset or emotions of whoever touches it yeah that actually is in Disney Star Wars so yeah just just putting that there in uh, clear like the kyber crystal concept is indeed part of Disney Star Wars but the extending the length of the lightsaber that's not part of it so just just letting putting that there <laughs> yeah it's it's still very odd for me to see but um so she actually, um, her dad gets ambushed and gets taken away, and she has to run away and f try to find the other Jedi. Mm -hmm. uh, so she goes up there, and she's ready to give the lightsabers to everyone. Everybody gets their lightsabers, and they all turn red. <laughs> so that means they're all actually Sith, um, save for one, save for one guy, and... They actually all end up dueling, including Margrave, Jura, who emerges from a droid who, you know, they speak earlier. Um, they don't know if that's him. And he emerges, and they all attack, and they... Margrave is like, no joke, I, I didn't think he would hold up, but he was just taking down these Sith like no other. And they're all like, oh no, cry they were just like crying and stuff, man, because like usually Sith are just like, they don't care about each other, but these guys were really... They, they somehow had like a little bit of a bond with one another. Um, you can tell. And as they're getting, you know, getting cut down and uh, eventually they all get cut, you know, get killed, except for uh, another um, Sith who they managed to influence him back to the light side um, or back to their way. And um, they eventually just go out and um, try to find another Jedi from there and restore the order. But I truly enjoy this episode a lot they had a lot of action a lot of twists uh, towards the end and i didn't see any problems it's definitely it is the longest episode by far uh, a longest episode of the series by far but i think it was definitely worth it yeah i agree i i actually think it was a really good one uh art style was really good the the way he handled the story and the characters also really good like really good episode so far it's definitely one of the best so. I wouldn't mind seeing like a sequel to this. Like, there might be another episode I might mention, but this one I would love to see like a continuation of this in the future. Well, let's hope production IG, the guys that made this episode, make another one in season two. Yeah. So, indeed. Anything else to say on this one? Uh, no. Okay, now we go to uh, episode six, T O B one. Okay, uh, uh, do you want to take it to Django or shall I take it? <laughs> uh, you can take this one. Okay, so to put it simply, a bearded human man wh whose name is uh, Professor Mitaka, he is basically in a laboratory with a droid named T.O.B. one and the droid emerges from the stasis chamber and, well, he's pretty much having these dreams of becoming a Jedi. And the professor is basically like, it seems like he's training him, preparing him to pretty much make him a Jedi. And 
Well, at one point, the droid, by accident, he pretty much gets into the garage that was prohibited for him to go. He finds a T-16 Skyhopper, and by accident, he pretty much uh, transmits a a message to that gets intercepted by a Sith. Yeah, that, that was a board Star Destroyer. And the Sith pretty much go and destroy the laboratory. Uh, but before the laboratory was destroyed, the professor pretty much hid away TOB-1, as well as also giving him parts of the lightsaber so that he could later construct it. And then when TOB-1 emerges, everything is destroyed. Uh, he's the only one left. He pretty much starts rebuilding the laboratory and rebuilding some of the droids and stuff. And pretty much getting ready to finally make the lightsaber and actually become a Jedi and he eventually does and then well and once he finally like lightsaber ready and he rebuilt everything well the Sith Inquisitor arrives and the droid is getting ready to pretty much fight him and they fight and well let's just say that the droid is victorious and the droid and with another buddy they pretty much leave the planet in search for well uh, searching for other Jedi, and that's where it ended. So, <laughs> uh, what do you think of this, the Django? <laughs> yeah, it's it was a pretty bad episode. I mean, it's not the worst in my opinion, but it it was not very good. And pretty much, it's <laughs> if you haven't picked up on it, it's Tob One is Toby and is very much akin to Mega Man, and we also have the Professor looking just like Dr. Light. We could put some images right up. <laughs> CJ will show something. But pretty much just Mega Man. But I actually didn't have a problem with the animation. I thought it was fine. Uh, the animation style, it's definitely, you know, more Mega Man style. But it was just like the execution of the whole episode was pretty bad. And I think this was more of like a kid-friendly episode. Like, kid-friendly in the sense of like five and under. <laughs> like kids who see that would would have no issue. I feel like the other episodes, yeah, not so much. But this one is just like the most kid friendly of the bunch because like they see like this, oh, happy droid and wants to become a Jedi, you know. Like it just seems like it's not for everyone. This is literally a Mega Man one of the episode or an Astro Boy one of the episode. Either one, <laughs> like it's it's. This is literally heavily heavily inspired by Mega Man. Almost like a Science Star wanted to just make their own version of Mega Man, but in Star Wars. And they thought, oh, we're making this episode of Star Wars. Then, but we want to make our own Mega Man episode. Then let's just combine both. <laughs> If they wanted to make a Mega Man episode, they should have just talked with Capcom, seriously. Because <laughs> playing in Star Wars, no. <laughs> this literally screams like a Mega Man wannabe episode. Like, it screams like one. And not in a good way. <laughs> so. Yeah, because, like, it's really bizarre to me, too. Because, like, you get images of him being a Jedi. A so it was, Jedi. like, his body destroyed and then eventually, like, converted to, like... A droid or something because like that's kind of like open to interpretation because like it's that's exactly like mega man like is that what it's like yeah like, or astro boy I tell because both yeah. mega man and astro boy they used to be human boys before they their bodies were destroyed and the professor pretty much rebuilt them in droid bodies <laughs> like yeah i mean <laughs> Christ. i i don't get it and plus like i i noticed something like with the audio cues and the the music that when the, we're fighting against each other, like the Toby and the Sith were fighting each other. I noticed there was like no music playing and the sound was like kind of off. So it, if you're putting something out there like that, like it just seems like you didn't do proper QC. Like I, I just feel like there was a lot <laughs> of bad execution in that episode. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. And oh God, guess what? The Django. So, okay, you know how the droid is called uh, Toby, right? You know, mm -hmm. well, Astro Boy is called Toby too. <laughs> really? Yeah, Toby. Toby Tenma. Oh, wow. Okay, where to rip the off? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, I guess there's that confirmation. So it's so it's literally ne- being a Mega Man and an Astro Boy wannabe episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this was easily the least creative of all the episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's this is literally Mega Man slash Astro Boy episode shoehorned into Star Wars. Because something else I noticed: the Star Wars elements are almost non-existent. You can literally, and even then, you can literally replace them with anything. And you can literally say this episode does not belong in Star Wars. Like, easily. Replace a T-16 Skyhopper with whatever ship. Replace a lightsaber with whatever other uh, electrical saver. Say, a Halo sword or whatever. And replace the Inquisitor with whomever else. And you lose nothing. You, literally, there is no reason for this to be in Star Wars. It doesn't belong. Like, uh, so yeah. And that is something that will carry on in the next episode of this company, Science Sorrow, but we'll get to that later. So, yeah. So, anyway, got anything else to mention on this one, Dijango? No. Okay. Okay. Now we go to the next episode, episode seven, The Elder. So, this episode, made by the same company that made the twins. However,. This episode is vastly different in execution compared to the twins. Because the twins was just over-the-top anime action all over the place. But this, it's actually kind of the opposite. And maybe the same company that made the -the over-the-top action in episode 3. So it's almost like 1080. So basically how the plot goes is... uh, Two Jedi, uh, Master and Apprentice, they basically get some sort of a... Dis- well, not they're basically investigating the Outer Rim territories uh, as a part of their uh, training and stuff. But then they, then the Master senses a disturbance in the Force. And they go and investigate this planet. And they're talking to the villagers and they find that apparently an elder man uh, from whatever place he came from, apparently he landed here and has basically been causing trouble. And so basically the Jedi investigate. The Master is investigating the ship while the Padawan is investigating the mountain where the elder Jedi supposedly is. And well, uh, the Padawan finds this, finds traces of some sort of a Jedi of sorts causing all sorts of trouble. Like for example, a one of the animals, uh, a Banga, was injured in the neck. Like he got a lightsaber cut through the neck, a uh, very precise one. So let's just say that the the master and the Padawan uh, they got a bad feeling about this. Yeah, pun intended. <laughs> So there's that. And then the Padawan encounters the older man. And the older man gets two lightsabers, red lightsabers ready. And they fight. But the Padawan is no match for the elder. And he gets taken down, put unconscious. And then the elder pretty much takes the Padawan somewhere so that he can lure in the Jedi Master. And the Jedi Master joins in. And the Master and the older man, they fight. But the elder master pretty much overtakes and beats the elder and the elder dies but not just the body just going there like the elder not only he gets a detonator out and blows up his ship and then his body turns to dust like yeah and then after that well the master and the padawan are discussing where this elder came from he was a safe or not and they they have some some talks about they have some, some talks about what this Sith elder could have been or, and what, how powerful it could have been back then compared to now. Like, and they just leave the planet. So, yeah, uh, that's the episode. So what do you think of this one, the Django? I wasn't overly impressed with this episode, I must say. It was pretty just subpar to me. So like, far. um hmm. I, 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 I expected a, maybe something a little bit more, but it's just like the Sith was... Um, so the guy, old man was voiced by James Hong, which was definitely more... I mean, it was definitely out there, and I, I could recognize the voice easily. I mean, he's been in films like uh, Big Trouble in Little China, Blade Runner, and all these other films, and pretty famous like uh, American actor. And then you also had James Hong, or I'm sorry, David Harbour as uh, Taijin. Uh, he's from Stranger Things. He's like uh, the buff sheriff, uh, bearded sheriff guy. Uh, but that was like the only thing that was stood out to me. But I feel like it, it, it was just like it, it, this episode really wasn't really anything special, in my opinion. Hmm, really? Because I actually thought it was a 
I actually thought was a good one because we see a master and a, and a padawan. Like while they are doing their their train their training, like you might might see more of the standard Star Wars story you'd see in a star in a Star Wars. But if you ask me, what I think sells this one is the art style and the animation. Cause I actually think it, it this definitely looks like a Star Wars anime in a sort. Like uh like this is how you, you would see um a regular star wars story in with japanese animation put in there like another not to mention i like how the old man his two sabers literally just look like red daggers like red red saber daggers and and his design also looked pretty creepy but also like an old like a, a creepy old man in some ways like he definitely felt like something you see in an actual anime <laughs> like for real out of the other anime art styles that i've seen in other anime you know like dragon ball c one piece uh hero my hero academia like that type of anime style i'm, I'm referring to so i don't think the story is what sells it here i think it's the visuals what sells this one uh if you ask me so and, and not only that but it is a, it is definitely refreshing seeing a disney star wars story where a master and an apprentice in a TV show, actually going through tra the training and facing a dark Jedi or a Sith, and quote unquote Sith, that is apparently much stronger than than it seems. Because because when you go because when you see stuff like Star Wars Rebels, where the, it's the Inquisitor against Kanan and Ezra, the Inquisitor gets his ass handed to him even by Ezra. So he he's barely like a challenge, but this old guy is actually a, can actually be a legitimate challenge if it wasn't for the fact that the Jedi Master was pretty much just a lot stronger. So stakes were definitely higher here than they ever were with Kanan and Ezra fighting the Inquisitor in Star Wars Rebels or something like that. So so I actually enjoyed this one. Uh, I actually don't think it's one of the it's one of the better ones episodes in this show though i don't think it's better than the duel or even than or even the nif jedi the, the nif jedi was actually really good with how the plot went so but yeah i actually think it's really good and considering what trigger did with episode three i actually prefer more this one because at least they're not going full-blown crazy with the anime action <laughs> so i th i thought it was interesting that the jedi master um towards the end of the fight he was like um this guy must have done it. He was like, seemed like Sith who was doing it for a while. And he was just kind of alluding to like, like if he, this guy was in his prime, I don't think I would have been a match against this guy. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I actually did really like this episode. Like, I actually think it was pretty, it was pretty good. It's definitely a 1080 from Trigger compared to episode three. Like, because episode three and seven, the older being episode seven, both made by Trigger radically different like radically different art style and radically different uh, story execution like you compare the twins to the older you it, without seeing who made them you could literally probably believe that they were not made by the same company but they were which is crazy like must have been a different uh director and a writer and a, di and a different animator which i just checked and yeah they're different director and different writer for both episodes so yeah, that explains it. So, but yeah, um, Elder was pretty good. So, final thing, final thoughts on this one, Django? Uh, no. Okay, now we go to episode eight, um, Loop and Ocho. So, so the Django, you want to take this one? Okay. So, Lop and Ocho, it uh, starts with an Star Destroyer approaching the planet, and. They have like these slaves, which seems like these rabbit people, and they're doing like their work and stuff. And we come to a young Lop, uh, who is the female rabbit at the time, and she is still wearing this uh, slave collar, but she's outside of that facility that houses most of the other her rabbit people and stuff like that. And eventually, she's caught as she is like a thief and stuff, and she's just trying to survive. And she gets caught by a guy by the name of Boss Yasabura of the Yasabura clan. And he takes pity on her. And eventually he takes her in with her daughter, Ocho, um, just because they kind of like seem to be of age, like the same age. And she needs a buddy. So they kind of like just take her in. And uh, years p pass by and they've gone, gone, grown through a bond. And... Uh, 
there's an attack that happens with the Galactic Empire. Uh, their one of their facilities gets just just gets blasted, and it was actually um, instigated by uh, Boss Yasaburo, and um, he's against what the Imperials are doing. And the daughter uh, Ocho is for the Imperials. She's siding with the Imperials completely, and uh, you know she Lop is trying to calm them down. And eventually, um, they just kind of, like, separate. And, um, yeah, uh, eventually you see Ocho uh, just completely side with the Imperials. And uh, eventually, Boss has to fight his daughter towards the end. And uh, Lop actually gets the lightsaber from the family. He gets inherited from Boss. And he was going to give it to uh, his daughter. But... As seeing as she's on the opposing side, he ends up giving it to Lop, and um, she uses it against the fight against her sister. And um, eventually, it seems like she almost kills her own father. But Lop actually intervenes, uses the lightsaber, and it seems like she strikes her down. But in the end, she actually is alive, and she is taken away. So that leaves off with the cliffhanger on what we're what they're gonna do, and uh, in the end, it's just Lop and her father, Boss, that is left to pick up the pieces from there. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, I I thought this episode at first I thought it was uh, like the beginning. I thought it wasn't gonna be get into serious tones or anything because when you see Lop, uh, you. You think that it probably will be another kid-friendly one, similar to episode six, because you know, uh, little female rabbits. Like it, it seems like something is gonna piece uh, little kids. But the more you see the episode, the more that actually that's not the case. It, it, it literally is like uh, portraying a legitimate like uh, Star Wars story where you see conflict where between a family. Like they have to literally decide whether to side with this faction that's known for being pretty much a dictatorship across the galaxy or to rebel against it and it causes conflicts between not only the father and the daughter but even the adopted daughter like it's definitely some heavy stuff and we see the results at the end which is which is even more like uh sad and y yeah like this episode definitely in a way kind of subverted my expectations <laughs> yeah subverted expectations so like yeah it definitely impressed me more than i expected yeah, I, I thought it was a good episode. I, I liked it quite a bit. And, uh, you know, initially you saw um, Ocho as being someone who's a bit of an arrogant asshole. Because, like, you see her just, like, wanting to claim Lop as just, like, this little bit of property. And just like, oh, I just need a friend. And you, you kind of see that in the beginning. And then over time, like, it just seems like all of a sudden she just, like, turns just like that into... The Imperials, and you kind of saw that in the beginning. Like, you saw her just going down that path. Even though it just seems kind of weird, because, like, you would think that Boss would be the one who would just be, oh, I'm for the Imperials, because they make me healthy, and, you know, they make me rich and stuff. And then it would be the younger one who's, like, opposed to that. But they kind of tw uh, turned it around. And, uh, you know, you, you see that dynamic where they fight one another, and I, I like the fight towards the end. And I, I do think that if they continue on, that this would be another, they could do another episode based off this, that because this leads off of a cliffhanger. Oh, yes. I do think they should continue it. I agree. Because, yeah, the way it ended in that cliffhanger, yeah, they, it needs to continue. Like, Geno Studio, please do a sequence in season two. Do it. So, it will be great. So, art style was also pretty good. Uh, yeah. No, no issues there. So, it was great. So yeah, and characters were also solid. Like no, no many real issues here. So it was great. So yeah, I like the uh, mix of like the samurai culture with the, you know, the Jedi and stuff like that. Because like you know, as you know, with Jedi, they're a mix of like different warrior cultures, like samurai, knights, you know, some mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, not to mention George Lucas was inspired by some Japanese cultures when making a Star Wars Episode Four, and you hope so. There's yeah. that too. So yeah, uh, anything else to say on this one, the jungle? No. Okay, so now we go to the last episode, episode nine, 
Akakiri from Science Sar. <laughs> uh, you want to go with this one, the Django, or should I do it? Uh, you could do this one. Okay, so it starts with apparently a Jedi having a making a stand against uh, some sort of bandits. He cuts it down with his blue lightsaber, but then he's like having some sort of uh, vision or trauma or something. But then uh, the Jedi is saved by some pe some people, and and then he recognizes one of the people being a female uh, princess named Misa, one of the three rescuers uh, that rescued uh, the Jedi. And so they basically make a plan in which they have to pretty much strike at a specific Sith that's, that's hiding among a ro the royal family. And so they pretty much set on their journey to go to to find the Sith. And they, they talk about it in the, in the way and then they get to literally the palace where they confront the Sith Lord. Who, and well, let's just say the oh, I forgot to mention that also Prince Misa was uh, captured uh, <laughs> bef before the Jedi got to the uh, so there's that and they they confront the Sith Lord uh, called Masago and well, it doesn't go well. Let's just say that um, the Jedi is not successful and he at one point got gave into his anger and killed several guards. And he also accidentally killed the princess. But then uh, Mas Masago, the Sith Lord, offers to help the Jedi to save Misa by literally joining him and literally uh, embracing the dark side. And he uses the dark side to pretty much heal Princess Misa. And then, well, the Jedi, he literally goes with Masago as his new Sith apprentice. And, well, the Star Destroyer leaves, and that's how it goes. Okay, so do you want to start with this one, the jungle, or shall I go? Yeah, I can go. Okay, so uh, right off the bat, I'm not a fan of the art style. I'm going to say right off the bat. Uh, I don't know what's up with Science Sorrow, but they... Their art style's never really been the the best. With the with, like Toby did not have uh like art style was good, but it did not feel like Star Wars. This is on the same camp, like and just like Toby, this episode once again the Star Wars elements are almost non-existent. Again, you can literally have this episode replace the Star Wars elements and put it in any other show. Like you can replace the Jedi and the Sith Lords lightsabers, and you can replace the Force healing that they did, and you can replace the element, the mentions of the Jedi and the Sith, and you'd have no difference. This is once again another episode that it that is embracing the Star Wars IP. It's it's not like I don't know what's up with Science Sorrow uh, episodes, but they literally just don't embrace Star Wars whatsoever. Like they. They just, like, whatever they do with their episodes, they just shoehorn the Star Wars elements in between. Like, they don't really build around the Star Wars universe like these other episodes from Star Wars Visions have done. Like, it's, like, I don't know what the hell is up with that. So, those are my problems. And the selection of music that they used, especially when the Jedi turns to the dark side and becomes the apprentice of Masago, like, bad selection of music. Like, it did not fit the tone at all. Like, it was this drums percussion when the Jedi joined the dark side, and I did not feel like it fit whatsoever. Like, it was very in inappropriate. Like, I thought they were going to go with, like, a, a Japanese remix-type version of, uh, I don't know, Battle of the Heroes or Duel of the Fates or the, do or, the, or the Sith theme or something like that. No, it's just some generic uh, music that you could hear in any other anime. And just... Not good, not good, uh, just not good. And also, this episode is pretty short. It's almost as short as Tatooine Rhapsody. Like, it literally cuts, uh, like, it feels like there, there should be more. Like, it just cuts in an awful cliffhanger of the Jedi just joining the Sith Lord. And there's no rescue attempt by the princess to get him back to the light. There's no seeing what happened later. Like, it just ended. It's just a 13-minute episode. It's not even 20 minutes. Like, what the hell? Like, seriously? This episode needed more time. <laughs> Christ. Uh, what do you think, Django? I'm noticing a trend with Sign Sor uh, Sorrow animations. The episodes, specifically, are terrible. 
Yeah. And this one is another one. Toby and then Akakiri. And easily the worst animation out of all the episodes by far. Just just a very bizarrely animated episode. And I think the only thing going for it is that George Takei is like one of the random people in the background. <laughs> That's it. Because everything else is just pretty bad in this. Like there's not really any there's the story is pretty bad. The animation is bad the sound is you know of course terrible so yeah i mean it's no surprise that another sign sorrow so i think they should not be bringing this studio no offense to them back to do star wars visions if they ever do a season two just don't bring them along again ever again (laughs) yeah or if you're gonna do it then make them literally improve the hell out of their writing and directing I mean, when making these episodes, if they're going to do it. And if they're going to do it, at least make a continuation to this one. Because seriously, what an awful cliffhanger to end with. Oh, and I wasn't simple... even interested to see a uh, second one. Because, like, <laughs> I think it would still be subpar in comparison. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree there. Oh, by the way, the Sith Lord is a female, not a male. Which, I mean, considering how the uh, how the anime depicts her, like, she looks like a humongous brute and with the armor you i cannot really tell if uh i guess the only way i could tell that she's a female is the lipstick and the earrings but she looks like a freak of nature that i cannot really tell if she's a female or not and the voice also doesn't sound uh that female like so like no offense to the voice actress it's just that whatever direction uh science saru made with this episode like the sith lord did not really look like a female sith lord like in like not in a good way so yeah they, like what the hell was science saru seriously like <laughs> there's no wonder that i think science saru's episodes are literally the worst part with tatooine raps already following soon uh like it's just bad like, th- like, don't. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have to agree with the Django. Yeah, Science Saru. I don't know what the hell they, they. Yeah, they. I don't think they're qualified to do. Or if they are qualified, then they they're def- they're gonna have to prove it. Well, <laughs> more than these two episodes. But right now, no. I just I just think they're just using Star Wars as a means to do whatever the hell they want, and not really actually making a proper Star Wars anime. They're just using the Star Wars elements shoehorned to whatever other ideas they have, and not good, not good. So yeah, Science Haru, no. So there's that. Anything else to mention on this episode specifically, Django? No. Okay, so those are the nine episodes, and, well, I gotta say, six out of nine episodes were good. With three of them, the ones that are bad are Tatooine Rhapsody, T.O.B. 1, and Nakakiri. With two of those being from the same studio, so (laughs) it's definitely a pattern with those two. (laughs) So, yeah, uh... Now, one thing I have to mention, because I know that anime enthusiasts definitely want to hear this. Um, is it worth it seeing this in English dub or in Japanese dub with English subtitles? And to be honest, either one is a good choice. There is no clear which one is better over the other one. And here's why. Most anime... The best way to watch it is Japanese English subtitles because not only obviously made by a Japanese animation studio, but also they were adopted from Japanese mangas or Japanese comics. Uh, So basically their, their source material is already Japanese by nature. And the translations that several studios have done overseas in regards to the anime, like with Dragon Ball Z and others, they get some mistranslations and some other errors which cause some problems. But here in Star Wars Visions... None of those problems exist. You can literally watch the Star Wars Visions in English or in Japanese English subtitles. I watched Star Wars Visions in both and there was no mistranslations, no errors in communication. Maybe one word changed or something, but it was a, but it was a synonym, so not much of a problem. Like literally, you can watch all these nine episodes, you can watch them in English or in Japanese. So there is no problem whatsoever of going with either one. So just leaving that there, there's no clear picture here because this is definitely Japanese animation, but in an American IP. So there is no difference. Watch it in either one or watch both. Literally, both of them are good choices. So yeah, there's that out of the way. So overall, 
what do you think the Django of Star Wars Visions as a whole? So I'm a little bit more critical of this show. I do, but I still do think it's a good show and it's absolutely worth watching. And I do think that eventually there's going to be a season two uh, down the road because I do think there's going to be. I'm just curious about like what the viewership of this whole series as a whole because I think it is still pretty high. And I think one of the main episodes that people are going to watch and people are talking about currently is the Ninth Jedi. So like. I feel like that definitely that a season two is going to happen and that, um, you know, I, I do want to see like different production companies involved, not just the same ones that we've seen before. And especially not Science Sorrow. Definitely not that. <laughs> yeah. Not As we sorry. mentioned. Before. Yeah. But I would love to see like new creators, um, you know, that have been involved in the um, anime scene and including like some like some of the biggest ones like um, like Studio Ghibli or Studio Ponic. But I don't see that likely, but I would love to see just like, you know, just a small animated short, you know, nothing too crazy, but I, you know, something from them, I think they would be, they would be, they would kill it if they did it. Mm -hmm. uh, Studio Ghibli, especially, because they're, they're some of the, they're like the best one out there. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Now, if we're going to get some returning studios, I'd say Production IG, Gino Studio, they de and Kamikaze Doga definitely should return. AKA the production companies that made The Duel, The Nymph Jedi, and Lupin Ocho. Those definitely should return. Trigger, I'd say, yeah, they, they sh uh, yeah, I'd say they should uh, return. Kinema uh, Citrus, I, I, would, I would want them to come back too. Yeah, too. I wouldn't mind. Yeah, I wouldn't mind to come back as well. Like, uh, but I think I think what I'm trying, what I'm also trying to say too is like we would love like you know some of the old ones coming back, but we also want a mix of new ones too because like there are so many different creative minds out there that to get them involved in something Star Wars related, I think that's just I I think that would be a dream for them and it would be great for us because we want variety. We don't want the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah. And I think, like, because, like, it focused a lot on Jedi and Sith, I would like something a little bit different. Like, maybe do something on bounty hunters or even something as simple as merchants. Or... I know it sounds stupid, but, like, if you have a creative mind behind it, like, you could make some, like, a really good story just off of that alone. I got a better idea. How about Mandalorians? Absolutely. You, you know I'm going to love that. <laughs> yeah. But I, I really want to see the Mandalorians in like a... Say if, if we got like, I don't know, uh, Production IG or Gino Studio, like making the animation. Just imagine seeing the Mandalorians in that sort of really cool anime anime art style. Like just imagine. Or even Trigger doing the anime art style akin to Episode 7, The Elder. Like imagine. Like... That'd be glorious. As long as it's not Studio Colorido, who did <laughs> Tatooine Rhapsody, who did an atrocious job on Boba Fett, then I'm fine with that. Yeah. Anything but that. Yeah, or Science Sorrow with whatever the hell they do with their own. Like, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, indeed. Anything else to mention in the jungle on Star Wars Visions? Just that we're, we, we enjoyed the show and we're excited for the future of this. Okay, so I guess uh, I guess we'll have to say our final conclusion. So, the jungle, go ahead. Okay, so this show comes recommended. If you already have Disney Plus, definitely watch this. It's definitely worth watching. There are some good episodes, and definitely get your own opinion because we might think, like I think, four or I think it was five of the episodes are good, but you know, CJ said a little bit different, and you might think differently too. You might like all of them. You might hate all of them. It doesn't matter. You have to actually watch it and then see it and get your own opinion. But for us, we the general consensus seems to be that we enjoy it, um, the majority. And it is definitely, there's some good, really good episodes. Uh, the Duel, definitely. Village Bride, uh, Ninth Jedi. You know, there's some good episodes out there. Animation is pretty top-notch, good stuff. And, uh, yeah, I think they did a fantastic job. So, um yeah, definitely, if you have Disney+, Plus, then the future is going to be high for more Star Wars projects. You know, you have The Book of Boba Fett coming out soon. You have The Mandalorian another season. I mean, things are looking great for Star Wars fans. Mm hmm Indeed. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, now as for me, Star Wars Missions, 
definitely worth watching. Um, if you have Disney Plus, yeah, watch it. So you'll have a good time. Just keep in mind, it's not canon, so don't don't get angry at whatever they do. So in regards to continuity, so not canon. Don't worry, just watch it and let's see if you enjoy it or not enjoy it. You'll see for yourself, but it's definitely worth watching it uh, in either English or Japanese. So give it a shot and definitely excited to see what they'll do with season two. So, yep. And with that, well, it comes the end of our impressions, thoughts on Star Wars Visions. So, we'll see you guys on the next State of Star Wars video. Bye-bye. See you guys.